I'm so thankful to see each of you here, and I hope that you have your Bibles open to Colossians chapter 3 as the primary part of our lesson will come from that chapter and these verses, Colossians chapter 3, and we're actually going to go back a little bit into Colossians chapter 2, and I want us to think this morning a little bit about being passionate, about being passionate. I appreciate your prayer, Derek, and those thoughts. And, uh, you know, all of our leaders in worship are doing just that. They're leading each of our minds in worship, and we all need to be participants in that and not observers. And uh, if you have any questions, if you're visiting with us about anything you may see or hear while you are with us, please don't hesitate to ask, and we'll be happy to sit down and talk with you. So this image I'm going to put up here, I want us to look at it for just a minute. If uh, my clicker will click, which it's not. Uh, Larman, you may have to help me out today. There we go. All right. I don't know what's going on. It's not a real clear picture. But there's this meme that floats around on social media from time to time. So I pulled it up, saved it. It says, if our churches had members with this kind of faithfulness and passion, we would change this world in no time. If you remember... In Acts chapter 17, when Paul went to Thessalonica, the response of the Thessalonians was, those who have turned the world upside down have come here also. Passion. Well, just look at that for a minute. Now, this is my kind of weather right here, folks. I would have no problem sitting in this. I would have, I'm a Dolphins fan, Miami Dolphins fan. I have been ever since I was just a little kid. That'd be a battle to sit down there and, September and watch a football game, 100 degrees, 100% humidity. That would not be fun. But most people don't like cold weather. Many of you would say most normal people don't like cold weather, so whatever. I had to look real close at this image. Over here on the right-hand side of it, I I I zoomed in as much as I could with any type of clarity, and I found out that this was in the Buffalo Bills football stadium, which makes sense. But you think of the discomfort that people experience in cold weather. Fingers get cold. Your toes get cold. Then you start to shiver. I've done that in deer stand. I'm sure many of you have too. And it just gets painful after a while. And then it's just time to go home. But a lot of people are willing to sit through a lot of suffering and endure some discomforts in weather and experiences, maybe the crowd around them, to enjoy a sporting event. I've always loved sports. I've always been involved in sports. Um, People will put up with a lot to watch a game, to be a fan, you know, to cheer on their team. But you just look, again, look at that picture, and everything, (laughs) everything and everybody is covered in snow. You look closely and you notice a bunch of empty seats. Well, people aren't going to tolerate, typically, this kind of weather You'd have to be passionate about your Buffalo Bills, wouldn't you? I do not like the Buffalo Bills. They're in the AFC East, and they have become the arch rivals of the Miami Dolphins. It used to be the New England Patriots. I'm not a, I'm not a Bills fan, but this picture shows the passion, the desire that some people have to support their team. And there's, a, like I said, that phrase at the top, if our churches had members with this kind of faithfulness and passion, we would change this world in no time. Well... You know, Jesus was faithful and passionate, and he was by and large rejected, wasn't he? He came to his own, and his own didn't receive him. John chapter 1 and verse 12. When the gospel was preached on the day of Pentecost in the city of Jerusalem, estimates tell us that there would be anywhere close to a million people in Jerusalem at that time. The historian Josephus tells us that, among other historians, a million people there. How many people obeyed the gospel that day? About 3,000 souls were added to them. Those who gladly received his word were baptized. 3,000 out of approximately a million is not very many. And they were in the presence, these are Jewish people at a Jewish feast day, in the presence of Jewish men who are speaking miraculously with other tongues. And the crowd knew that. And they've been waiting for the Messiah. They've been waiting for the kingdom. For, For a few years now, John the baptizer had been preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Matthew chapter 3 and verse 7. 
Jesus, Matthew chapter 4 and verse 17, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The apostles have been preaching this. You have this group of people in Acts chapter 2 who have been waiting for this day for the kingdom of God to come. And it came with power, didn't it? According to Luke chapter 24, remember Jesus told his apostles, I want you to go to the city of Jerusalem and wait there until, until you were endued with power from on high. And that's where repentance and remission of sins will be preached in his name. That's where it's going to start. The Jewish people knew this. Their scrolls, their Old Testament books told them about all of this. And so they're there on that day for that feast. And the, the message that's preached is the truth. That's why the text tells us in Acts 2 and verse 37 that those who heard those words were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And yet only 3,000 souls that day put Christ on in baptism. Only 3,000 people who had been waiting for this gladly received His Word. Acts chapter 2 and verse 41. That's not a lot of passion, is it? They, they were looking for something, and when it came, it wasn't what they wanted. And I think that's a lot of times what happens with people. So just look at that picture. There are empty chairs. There are people in discomfort. Adverse weather conditions, to say the least. But you've got some passion, don't you? Well, what does it mean to be passionate? Show, showing or caused by strong feelings or a strong belief? Well, you see that sometimes in the Chiefs games, don't you? It gets pretty chilly up there. And you'll see fans on the lower sections without shirts on, screaming and acting crazy. They, well, they probably are, among other additives in their system, helping them along that way. But that's passion. They have strong feelings about something. They have a strong belief that their team is going to win the Super Bowl or whatever the case may be. What is the bare minimum that a sports fan could do for their team? Well, they could show up at a game, couldn't they? They could maybe have a bumper sticker or a license. They could have something that, that um, associates them with their favorite franchise, baseball, whatever it is. What's the bare minimum that you and I as Christians can do if we claim Christ, okay, if we have, like those in Acts chapter 2, if we've received the apostolic teachings and we've been baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, you've been added to the church as is told to us there in Acts chapter 2, what is the bare minimum that a, that, that type of person could do to proclaim their uh, love to proclaim their devotion. I don't know if I would, I would. I probably wouldn't use the word passion if we're talking about the bare minimum. Would you? That, that's not very passionate. But what is the bare minimum that we could do as, as baptized believers for the cause of Christ? The bare minimum we could do would be to show up for worship, wouldn't it? And to show up faithfully. As we, you know, you've heard it throughout your entire life. Show up when the doors were open. We've heard that phrase before. That's the bare minimum, isn't it? Now, is that what we are seeking, though? Is that what we should be seeking? That's the question. Should we be seeking to just squeak by? Well, I was at church on Sunday. Is that, is that how it should be? Look at your scripture reading again. If then... Ye are risen with Christ. If ye then, the King James says, be risen with Christ. The question is, risen from what? Is there anything in the text that would necessitate Paul saying, you've been raised? Yeah, there is. You know, and, and you guys have heard me talk about this before, that the chapter and verse breaks up, breakups in our Bible are not very helpful. Sometimes they are, but most of the time they interrupt a thought. You need to know that when the Bible was written, it wasn't written by chapters and verses. When Paul sat down to write what we call the four-chaptered letter to the Colossians, it was just a letter. It wasn't four chapters with how it, 95 verses in it. It was just a letter of words. A lot of people believe that these letters served as sermons, that when they, when these, whenever these letters made it to these churches that following Lord's Day, they would be used as the sermon. Could you imagine the response I would get if I got up here and just read to you the book of Colossians? Well, that boy doesn't know how to preach. He just read Scripture to us. That's what they did in the first century. This was a sermon. 
And you look at these letters, that's what they were. They were designed to exhort and to rebuke and do whatever the Word of God is designed to do to the congregation in the assembly. In fact, we are here in the book of Colossians. Look at Colossians chapter 4. Look at verse 16. You say, how do you know what you're talking about? Well, I've read history for one, but I also read the Scriptures. Look at Colossians 4.16. And when this epistle is read among you, this letter was read among the church. When the church. Well, how do you do that? The church has to gather together. Cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. So not only did Colossae get this letter, when they read it among the brethren, they swapped letters with the church at Laodicea. Some people think the church at Laodicea References the book of books of Thessalonians. I don't, I can't nail that down for sure, but that's what some people. Whatever the case may be, that's what they did. That's part of what they did. Let's say it that way. What would necessitate Paul saying, "If ye then have been risen with Christ, seek those things which are above." Back to this chapter and verse division thing. It's said for us back in Colossians chapter two. Notice with me, beginning in verse eleven. In whom, talking about them being in Christ, see verse 10, or verse 9, in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form, and you are complete in Him. See, one of the reasons the book of Colossians was written was because there was a, there was a weird mixture, a weird uh, amalgamation of teachings that was going on within the body of Christ. And one thing that was being said was, you are, with your knowledge of Jesus, you don't have enough. You need more stuff. I'm going to share that with you here in just a few minutes as we go through the text. But Paul's writing to say, no, you're complete in him, Colossians 2.10. He's complete, verse 9, you're complete in him. He's the head over all principality and power, in whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision without hands, in putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. What in the world does that mean? Now, we're familiar with circumcision, we're introduced to it in, in um, Genesis chapter 17. That was the, the sign of God's covenant with Abraham. And it carried on over into Judaism, didn't it? All of the Jewish males were circumcised at eight days old. Jesus himself, you go to Luke chapter 2, they did exactly what the law required for Jewish males. But he's talking about a circumcision made without hands. And it has to do with the, the putting off or the cutting off of the sins of the body. What does that mean? Look at the next verse. Buried with Him. The Greek literally says, having been buried with Him in baptism, wherein also you are, here we go, why does Paul say, if then you be risen with Christ in Colossians 3 and verse 1? Because of Colossians 2 and verse 12. You're buried in baptism, wherein also you are risen with Him through the faith of the operation of God. One of the most important verses for us today, and I'll, I'm going to explain why that's the case. Every verse is important. Every verse on baptism is important. But why is, why is this one particularly important? Because here's what a lot of people tell us about baptism. Well, they tell us, number one, well, that's a Church of Christ teaching. Church of Christ teaches you need to be baptized. No, it doesn't. That is not a Church of Christ doctrine. That is an apostolic doctrine. This idea that a person needs to be buried in water and raised to walk in newness of life did not originate with the church of Christ. That's a lie that people believe. And, you know, it's, it's, what's that old saying? It's easier to believe a lie you've heard a thousand times than a truth you've heard once. A lot of people have been fed that lie that the church of Christ, you know, we started in the 1800s, we're told. In America, we're told. It's easier to believe a lie you've heard many times than to hear the truth you've heard for the first time. If you then be risen with Christ, buried with Him in baptism, wherein, too ye are, wherein also ye are risen with Him through faith in the operation of God. Baptism is not something where I am earning my salvation. When you submit your will to God and you are baptized in water for the remission of sins, you're putting your faith in the working of God. So the King James, if you're looking at the old king, it says, you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. If you're looking at a new King James, which I've got up here with me, it says, uh, buried with him in baptism, in which also you are raised with him through faith in the working of God. 
See, the reason this verse is so important for us is because so many people tell us today that if you emphasize baptism too much, that you're taking away from God's grace. God didn't do enough, and so you Church of Christ people tell me I have to be baptized to make up for what God didn't do. Absolutely wrong. In fact, it's the exact opposite of that. God did everything for me. All I have to do is submit my will to His, and I put my faith in Him. That's, why you're, that's how you're saved by faith. You're saved by faith, right? Have you ever read Romans, read Romans chapter 5? You're justified by faith. Ephesians 2, you're saved by grace through faith. But you're also buried in water because you've put your faith, look at the verse again, in the operation of God. It's not me working in baptism. It's not me earning my salvation when I'm buried in water. It's God doing what He said He would do when I do what He's commanded. You remember what Jesus said in the Great Commission? In Mark, Mark's account of the Great Commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes, believes what? The gospel that you're preaching to all the world. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be condemned. So I'm not placing my faith in myself, and I'm not trying to earn anything. From what have, have these Colossians been raised? From what have I been raised? If I have submitted my will to God's and I've been baptized, I've been raised from the waters of baptism. It says it in 2.12, and it, it emphasizes there in Colossians 2 and verse 12 that our faith is in the operation of God, and finish the verse now, who raised him, Jesus, from the dead. He raised him from the dead physically. When I obey the gospel, I'm raised from the dead spiritually. And now, Romans 6, 4, I walk in newness of life. Raised from what? Raised from that. Okay, so what? You guys hear me ask that question in sermons <clears throat> all the time. So what? From what are we raised? I want to just give you a list here real quick. And talk about us as we will make the list and then we'll make some application at the end about this idea of being passionate. Well, you're raised from death. Look at Colossians chapter 2 and verse 13. And you, being dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he, the King James says, quickened, made alive, together with him, having forgiven you all your trespasses. Notice how all that's tied together. And all of it's tied in together with Buried with him in baptism, being raised, having faith in God's working, the God who raised Jesus from the dead. Well, you're raised from death. See, when you're in sin, when you, for a <clears throat> couple things here. For a person who has <clears throat> come to a point in their life when they are able to have faith. You know, one of the things that Paul says in Scripture, this is recorded in Romans chapter 7, I believe in verse 9, 7, 8, or 9. Romans chapter 7, he says, I was alive once without the law. There is a point in our lives where all of us are alive physically, but we, we don't have the mental capacity to understand law. We don't have the ability mentally to come to faith in Christ. You're not accountable. You're not, there's no way you can sin. Where there is no, where there is no uh, law, there can be no sin. We call this the age of accountability, don't we? I mean, you think, you look around our auditorium. We have many sitting in this auditorium who are at an age, they don't have the ability to come to faith. You can't reason with them out of the Scriptures and, and them have a faith that I believe in Jesus, I believe in God. I, it, all of us are at a point in time, have a point in our lives where we are like that. But then we reach this age, and again, we call it the age of accountability, where now we have this faculty we have the capability of reading Scripture and coming to faith and seeing sin for what it is and seeing the consequences of sin. Until we do that, we're in death. We are separated from God. Paul says this exact same thing in Ephesians chapter 2. And it's interesting, if you lay Ephesians down and Colossians down next to each other, they're twins. They talk about the exact same things in almost the same order written to two different congregations. So these churches were dealing with many of the same things. But from what are we raised, Colossians 3.1? Well, you're raised from death. You're dead in sins <clears throat> before you obey the gospel. A second thing you are raised from is trespasses. Okay, God, so God has, he has made a, 
a boundary. And when you trespass, what that means is you've gone beyond the lines that God has drawn. When you obey the gospel, it's for the remission of sins, isn't it? Acts 2.38, when you're baptized into Christ. Again, you place your faith in Jesus. God will do what He's promised. When you do what He's commanded, you're raised from your trespasses. Notice again that language at the end of Colossians 2.13. He has quickened together with Him, having forgiven you all trespasses. That's another thing too. Think about this. When a person hears the gospel and obeys it, when they are lowered into that water, when they're buried, and by the way, not sprinkled or poured, that's not baptism. That's sprinkling and that's pouring. Baptism is a burial. It's an immersion. But when that happens, all of your trespasses are forgiven. Everything that you have ever done that has violated the will of God, everything that's a trespass, is wiped away. You, you've heard this before. You get a clean slate. You get a fresh start. You're born again. That's John chapter 3, isn't it? You're born of water and the Spirit. You start all over. You're dead in sins. You're dead in trespasses. When you're buried with Him in baptism and you place your faith in the operation of God, all of that's taken away and you get a new start. That's a hopeful message. All right, from what else are you raised? Well, you're raised from a shadow. Look at Colossians chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. So all of this discussion, baptism, being raised, being dead, being in trespass, now he talks about the something when Jesus was nailed to the cross, was nailed right there with him. Having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, uh, triumphing over them in it, in the cross, in his death. Let no man therefore judge you in meat, food, the King James says meat, but foods, drinks, respect of a holy day, or of the new moon, or of Sabbath days, now do you know what he's talking about has been nailed to the cross? New moons and Sabbaths and holy days. He's talking about the old covenant. That was nailed to the cross with Jesus. And notice verse 17, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body, the fullness, is of Christ. So I'm going to kind of lay out with you what... What are some things that the Colossians were dealing with? I've got some things written here in the margin of my Bible that we know they were dealing with. Well, obviously, they were dealing with Judaism. And that was a main problem with the church in the first century, where these, these people who had come from a Jewish background trying to bring Judaism with them into Christianity and trying to bind it on everybody else. That's one thing. There's another thing, and we're going to actually read about it here in just a minute. But the idea of, do you know what asceticism is? The denying of fleshly desires because, you know, the flesh is wholly evil. And so you have to cut yourself off from any comforts in life. You've heard of monks. You've heard of monasteries. It's kind of the idea. Separating yourself from anything that might pollute you in this world. Well, people were trying to mix that in with the gospel. The gospel doesn't teach that. That you have to separate yourself from society so that you can be more holy. We're, in fact, we're called to do the exact opposite. We're to be a light to the society, aren't we? We're to be a light in the world, not pull ourselves out of it so we're never defiled. We're supposed to be in it, and we're supposed to resist temptation. So you've got asceticism, you've got Judaism, you've got mysticism. Look at Colossians 2 and verse 18. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Let me read that to you from the, <clears throat> from the New King James. Let no man cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen. It's not much difference, is it? Some versions read a little bit differently. But the idea here is these Colossians, were, there were people who were trying to drag them back into Judaism. And Paul says, you've been raised, that's, that's done. That was nailed to the cross with Jesus. I got an anonymous letter in the mail yesterday, the last edition of the local Fulton County Gospel News. 
I did an article on the Sabbath day. Because that's a question that a, that a lot of people have in the religious world. Should Christians celebrate or honor, observe, whatever, the Sabbath day? Well, the, the short answer to that is no. It's not part of the New Covenant. That's part of the Old Covenant. And Paul even says it here in Colossians 2, verses 14 through 17. But I got this letter that three pages long, no return address, and no signature. Just, I want to get my point across, and I don't want to hear back from you. That's, that's basically what an anonymous letter is. Telling me how, and the, the idea of the letter was telling me how sa- the Sabbath day was, is part of Christianity. We should honor the seventh day of the week. That Catholicism changed that under, under Constantine in the 300s. All of that is demonstrably false. But people still hold these beliefs. Those things were nailed to the cross. That's not part of New, New, New Testament Christianity. It was part of the law of Moses. And that was taken out of the way. And notice again what the, what the end of verse 7, well, all of verse 17 says. Those things were a shadow. The fullness is in Christ. You're not lacking anything in Christ. And that's what people were doing in Colossae. They were saying you are lacking these. You do need to be celebrating these holy days and these feasts and these Sabbaths. Did you realize that there are over 50 different Sabbath celebrations under Judaism? I wonder if those people who believe that that's part of Christianity know that. That it's not just a... Saturday observance, but that there are many, many regulations. And I wonder at the same time if those who still observe the Sabbath day today, do they go to Jerusalem like that law required so they can offer their sacrifices? Because the law that requires the Sabbath observation is the same law that requires you need to go to Jerusalem three times a year and bring a sacrifice with you. I doubt it. And so they're inconsistent. We've been raised from that in Christ. That's been nailed to his cross. All right, what else in this te- text? Fleshly mind. We've been raised from a fleshly mind. Look at Colossians 2, 18 and 19. We've already read verse 18, verse 19. And not holding the head. So you're doing these other things. Things you really don't even understand, he says in verse 18. But you're not holding the head, Christ, from which all the body, by joints and bands, having nourishment, ministered and knit together, increaseth with the increase of God. You're not putting... What he's ultimately saying here is you're not putting Christ in his proper place. He's not being elevated the proper way. You know, and isn't New Testament Christianity, isn't Jesus the central message of all of that? I think of what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. He said, And I, brethren, when I came unto you, I came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Uh, Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14. God forbid, Paul says, that I should glory except in the cross of Christ. See, the Colossians weren't doing that. They had other things pulling at them, and they weren't holding the head in the proper place. We've been raised from those fleshly things, raised from having a fleshly mind. What else? Christians should be raised from the commandments and doctrines of men. Look at verses 20 through 23. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ, well, you've been buried with him. If ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are you subject to ordinances? Why are you adding, in other words, these other requirements that the gospel doesn't require? What do you mean, Paul? Touch not, taste not, handle not. That's that idea of asceticism. You have to separate your physical body from these things in order to be more holy. You've got to separate yourself from society, from other influences. Which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. And again, that's, that's really the crux of the problem here. They're following the commandments and doctrines of men. Notice what he says of those Commandments and doctrines of men in verse 23. Which things indeed, which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship. I like how the, look at, if you look at a New King James, it says, these things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion. That's actually a better translation of the phrase here. 
self-imposed religion. Uh, neglecting of the body. Not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. See, there was a common belief, and this, this belief actually is still common today in the religious world, that your fleshly body is evil, and it can only do evil, and your soul is good. So anything that you do with your body n- does not affect your soul. I listened to a sermon a couple years ago that there was a preacher in a very well-known denominational group. And one of the things that he said in this sermon was, there is nothing that you can do with your body that will ever affect your soul. So, hey, what, then what, can, what can't you do? If that's true, if you can use your body for whatever you want because your flesh is evil anyway and it doesn't affect your soul... That's like a that's a free pass for whatever you want to do, isn't it? Well, that belief system existed in the first century, and it still exists today, that the flesh is wholly evil and the spirit's wholly good. We've been raised from that kind of foolishness. We're created in the image of God. Now, God is not a physical being as we are. He's not limited by time and space. But we have that, that eternal part of us that's made in the image of God. And we're to use this body to glorify God. That's why we have it. Our body is bought with a price, according to 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20. And so we've been raised from these commandments and doctrines of men, people who will try to sneak into the church and say, you guys aren't doing, here are some things you need to add to your Christianity because you're not doing enough. Well, if you're doing what the gospel says, you're doing enough because you're doing what God requires. Therefore, all right, so... You have all of those things, verses 13 through 23. You have then our scripture reading. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. What do we do? Based on that fact that Christ is coming back, That there is a judgment day coming that we are going to have to give an account. What do you do? Look at the first word of verse 5. The King James says, mortify. All right? The New King James says, therefore put to death. There are things that you have to stop doing. He's already said it twice. He said it in Colossians 2. He said it now in chapter 3 that you are dead. You've died to self. What do you do? You put to death your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil evil concupiscence. Evil concupiscence, that's an interesting term. Passions, strong driving passions to fulfill fleshly desires. Now we're talking about being passionate towards God in a spiritual sense and doing what He would want us to do. But there are passions that we need to put away. And covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh upon the children of disobedience. Look at verse 7. In the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. Well, that was before they were buried in Christ. That was before they obeyed the gospel. But they've died to that. And they were buried in Christ. They had faith in God's operation in their baptism. And they were raised to walk in a new life. You can live in sin, verse 7. You can walk in sin. But the Christian shouldn't be doing that. But now, ye also put off all these. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Let not uh, Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. See, this is another sermon we're going to do here probably next Sunday. Put on, put off. We've been talking, t- kind of taking a break from that today, but we've been talking about this bib- the, these significant biblical phrases. Do you realize how many times you're told to put something off? And then put something else on. It's not enough to stop doing something bad. You don't live in sin, but it's not enough just to not do bad things. Well, how do you know that? Verse 10. Put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge. You've got to start thinking differently. It's after the image of him who created him. Now we start thinking like God. That's based on the proper knowledge. There's neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian or Scythian. Everybody's on the same playing field, you might say. Christ is all and in all. 
And so put on, therefore, as the elect of God. You've already got to put off. But it's not enough just to stop doing things. You've got to put on, holy and beloved, vows of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing. And it goes on and on all the way down through verse 17. In fact, look at verse 17. Whatever ye do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. How do you do all that? If, you've, if you're like the Colossians and you've lived a life, and I mean, He tells you what they used to do because they're told to put those things off. You go from that life to this new life. How do you do that? Well, you've got to have some passion about you. You've got to, you've got to have some strong feelings. You've got to have a strong belief that I'm doing what is the will of God, and my life is going to change. I've died. My life is hidden with Christ in God. Colossians 3 and verse 3. I've been risen to a new life. What's the bare minimum that you can do as a Christian? Well, you can show up at church occasionally. But is that what we're striving for? Is our faithfulness measured by our attendance? Let me say a couple things about that. If you're faithful, you'll attend. There, you know, we talk about priorities sometimes, and I've done this myself. You know, God's the first priority, and then there's number two, and I think I'm wrong about that. God's not even in that category. There's just God and His will, and then I prioritize everything else under that. And I think when we rank Him as number one, we might be, we, I might have the wrong perspective there, because that's like I'm comparing Him with something else. That's wrong. It's God. And then I prioritize. If my view of Christianity is my... If my barometer of my faithfulness is how often I attend, I think we're missing it. That is something a faithful Christian will do because, well, because it's God. And then everything else gets prioritized. Everything else comes under that. Where will you be tonight at 6 o'clock? And is that even a discussion to be had in your house? Where will you be Wednesday night? Now, again, that, I want you to understand something. That's, that's not the only thing that measures your faithfulness. But it is one of the things that measures your faithfulness, isn't it? And what, I think what's happened a lot of times is that's the only thing that's focused on, is my attendance. Well, I was here at church. Yeah, well, so what? Have you ever read Colossians chapter 3? That you've got to have some passion about you, that you've, you've died to yourself, and that now it's God and, and then that's it. And that doesn't mean you neglect the other things in life. You know, I, you know I don't mean that, but everything is prioritized under that, under Him, under service to Him. You think back to that picture of that Buffalo Bills stadium, and uh, I would say that, that those fans were, I would say that's more than the bare minimum. Who in the world wants to sit out in that kind of weather other than me here? But when we think of our faithfulness, for sometimes we've gotten so shallow in our Christianity these days, so shallow, that the primary point of reference of a Christian's faithfulness is if they're at church. You've heard me say this before. You can, you can stand in a garage all day long. You'll never be a car. Right? You can sit in a church building every time the doors open. So what? It doesn't make you a Christian. Is that what a Christian is that one thing a Christian does? Absolutely, without question. Because God's at He's seek first the kingdom of God. You've probably heard that somewhere before. You've read that in the book somewhere. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's, that is the primary thing. And then we prioritize everything else underneath that. How is your passion? Do you define your faithfulness to Christ based on your attendance at an event, like in that picture? Because that's what we've often done, and we've, we've turned worship into a spectator sport where, I mean, look, and, and I've done this before, look around you right now. Look how this building is arranged. How is this structure arranged? It's arranged for a performance, isn't it? 
Because I'm up here in front of you and you're all looking at me. And I'm looking at you. I'm the one talking. But I'm not here for you in the sense of to entertain you. God is our spectator, isn't He? He's hearing what I'm saying, but just as much as He's hearing what I'm saying, He's seeing what you're doing. And so, we have to have the right perspective on our worship. We need to be faithful in our attendance. I've noticed our Sunday night and Wednesday night attendance has been down lately. And I know we've, we've had some folks out of town, we've had some sickness lately, but you know what? You've always got folks out of town, and you've always got sickness. It's always going to happen. Where's your passion? And again, that's not the only measurement of a Christian's faithfulness. And, and if it is, that's a very shallow measurement. Because what are you going to be doing tomorrow? How are you going to be living tomorrow? Is it going to match up with what you claim to be as you're here today? If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things. That's a present tense verb. You keep on doing this. Keep on seeking those things which are above where Christ is. Set your affection on those things not on things of this world. That takes passion. That takes a drive. And too many of us, myself included, we can lose that, can't we? we we're always in danger of losing that. And we have, to, we have to constantly, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, examine ourselves, make sure that we are in the faith, prove ourselves. We need to be faithful. But it's more than... It's more than what oftentimes it's made out to be. I was at church. Are you a Christian? Let's start there. Because that's where it all starts. If you've never done what we've been talking about today, you look, at, look again at Colossians 2 and verse 12, buried with him in baptism. If you've never done that, I heard the other day, I can't remember who I was talking to. doesn't matter. Anyway, baptism is for those who can come to faith. You know, there are large religious bodies in our world that will baptize babies because they believe you're born in sin. You're born of the sinful nature, and so you need to be baptized to wash that sinful nature away. Folks, that's not biblical. Not even close. In order to be baptized properly, you have to be able to come to faith in Christ. You have to be willing to make the great confession. You Think of the Ethiopian eunuch there in Acts chapter 8. Here's water. What's stopping me from being baptized? Philip said, well, if you believe, you may. And he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I've never seen a, I've never seen a two-month-old do that. Or a two-year. They can't do that. They don't have that capacity. Baptism is for those who have, faith, who, who have the ability to come to faith in Christ, who have the ability to know what sin is and what the consequences are, to be baptized into Christ properly. That's the first step. That's the beginning. That's the, the rebirth, if you will. Titus chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. If you have questions about that, or if you are ready to be baptized into Christ today, we want to help you. We'll, we'll answer any question that you may have, but you need to let us know. Maybe you're here this morning and you've done that in the past, but you've, not, you've lost your passion. You've lost that desire. You've just... It, it, You've got the five steps of salvation and the five acts of worship and you think your ticket's punched. You're not. It's not it. Those are crucial parts of Christianity. Absolutely. But if that's the sum total of your Christianity, you're going to have a sad surprise on the day of judgment. Just read one chapter like Colossians 3. There's so much more to the Christian life than that. If you need to come back today, we want to help you. We'll do anything that we can. And we know that God... He's that father who's waiting for the prodigal to return, isn't he? And when he, <clears throat> and when he sees him come, what does he do? He rushes out to meet him. If you need to come back, let's take care of that today. If there's anybody who needs to respond in any way, let's do it right now as we stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up.